Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Coco Khan. And I'm Nish Kumar. Coming up, Labour's King of the North, Andy Burnham. And we ask him the question, can Maya save the UK? Also, is the Home Office failing the Windrush generation all over again? And why you may have to sell a kidney to pay your goddamn mortgage. Hi, Coco. Hi. How's your week been? Yeah, it's pretty good. I went to the seaside. Did it rain? Yes. Did I swim in possibly sewage? Also, yes. But... Not as bad as Boris Johnson's week, that is for sure. <laughs> He's, uh, on his birthday, he found out that only seven out of 650 of his work colleagues actually liked him, which, by the way, is my number one workplace anxiety nightmare. What, the people don't like you? Yeah, do you not have that if you go for drinks like with your work colleagues and the next day you wake up and you're just standing there <laughs> making a fucking cup of tea like, they all hate me, they all hate is, me. Is this a specific reference to the fact that you and I went out on Friday? <laughs> <laughs> It is, yes. <laughs> don't worry, I don't hate you. Oh, great. We, That's good. We went out to celebrate uh, our friend Nick Eshukla writing a Spider-Man comic. Yeah, it was really I, cool. I got to take you to a comic book shop. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I feel like you should take me to a rave as a sort of exchange yeah, programme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then afterwards, shall we vote on whether we still like each other? <laughs> that, that is genuinely... Horrific. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, there was a vote to approve the report by the Privileges Committee into whether Johnson misled the Commons as Prime Minister. Uh, 354 MPs voted for it. Seven voted against it. All no marks, I think it's very important to say. The list of the seven... I'm like, who are you, man? The person I'm really excited about was Rishi Sunak because Rishi Sunak took a very, very strong vo- position on this vote. And the strong position that he took was... Please don't ask me. I'm simply too frightened. Listen to this clip from him being asked about the committee on Good Morning Britain. Well, this committee was established under the former Prime Minister. It commanded the confidence of the House at the time, and I'm sure that they've done their work thoroughly, and I respect them for that. Obviously, this is a matter for the House, uh, not for the government, and that's why each and individual colleagues will make up their own mind when the time comes. So are you not going to be there? I said, each and individual colleague will make up their own mind when the time comes. This is a matter for the House rather than for the government. It's an important distinction, uh, and that's why I wouldn't want to influence anyone in advance of that vote. But you promised professionalism, accountability, integrity at every level. Boris Johnson has undermined all of those. Do you not need to set an example and vote for him to be punished for that? As I said, this is a matter for the House. It's not a government matter. This is why it's important that Sunak didn't take a position on this, right? Because in some ways, you can see the argument that he's trying to make that, look, this is a matter for Parliament and it's, uh, as you know, it's not as Prime Minister, it's not my responsibility to influence it. But one of the things he pledged to do when he became Prime Minister was to bring integrity and accountability to the government. And he has not done that. And the reason he hasn't done that is that there is still a small core of Conservative voters who let's be clear, did not vote for Rishi Sunak. They specifically voted for Liz Truss. He lost that leadership election and then he was put in office by Tory MPs. They didn't let him go to the electorate, uh, the Tory electorate, because there was this still this fear that they wouldn't vote for him. So we, we have a prime minister who still remains afraid of the party membership and is governing on that basis. The problem for Sunak here is that by dodging this entire issue, he's failed really to deliver on his promise of bringing integrity and accountability to number 10. And the reason that that is even bigger a problem for the chicken shit arsehole is that he's not exactly delivering anything else, is he, Coco? You all, I know, very excised about the issue of people not being able to pay their mortgages, right? Right. So if we've got a situation where people are struggling on a month-to-month basis with their living expenses. Absolutely. And he's not doing anything there. At least you would think, well, at least he's, you know, done something about Johnson, but he's fucking doing nothing. Absolutely, absolutely. As it happens, and we are going to talk about inflation in in interest rates, but as I was coming into this recording on my, uh, it's not iPod shuffle anymore. That's not what it's, what is it called? Your iPod (laughs) shuffle. I don't have an iPod. I promise I don't. I'm very young. Every week you fight (laughs) the label that you and I have become South Asian uh, uncle and aunties. And yet here you sit saying, I was just on my iPod (laughs) shuffle. I meant I was on. Were were you on your mini disc player? Did you fire up the gramophone, Auntie Coco? On my Walkman. (laughs) You were on your (laughs) Discman. I was on my mobile phone. It's an Apple iPhone, actually. And I was listening to (laughs) It's a Nokia with an iPod stuck (laughs) to it. I'm looking at it right now. (laughs) 
I was listening to some music on it and whatever the thing is where it just plays random songs, Shuffle, is yeah, it called? It's called Shuffle. Maybe yeah. it is, yeah. Um, was a song by Janet Jackson and that song was What Have You Done For Me Lately? <laughs> and I think that song is the song of right now. You know, you're looking at the fridge, everything in there has cost you up to 20% more. What has he done for me lately? Rishi Sunak, nothing. As we record this on Wednesday, we've just learned that the UK's inflation rate stayed at 8.7% despite hopes of a fall. And so interest rates are expected to rise for the 13th, lucky number 13, consecutive time as the Bank of England attempts to tame the highest rate of inflation in the G7 ahead of Italy, which hit 8% in May. So the, the... just in case anyone was unclear, as I admittedly have been until recently, I didn't realise that the Bank of England's only weapon against inflation rates was putting up interest. I didn't quite realise that. And the way that functions is this. If the average household has to spend more on their debt, on their borrowing, so for example, their mortgages, they don't have more money to spend on like, I don't know, concert tickets, avocado toast or whatever yeah. you know they're spending it on. Now, That hasn't worked. That's why they keep putting the interest rates up. I have a theory that's because we're not actually buying avocado toast. We're actually just buying like electricity. Yeah, just like (laughs) toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, just the the essentials. So I don't think that our discretionary spending can really be changing. We're just spending it on essentials and therefore we're just being squeezed. The government, of course, will point the finger at anyone but themselves about why that problem has happened. It's because of Ukraine. It's because of, you know, something else that isn't to do with our Brexit or to do with that woman who looked like a lettuce and, you know, blew the hole in the economy. You could also argue that the stamp duty holiday was actually an error because it incentivized people to take out mortgages and to move. And now many of those people who are on fixed term mortgages, they are facing unbelievable hikes, hikes that they cannot afford. That is a nightmare for Rishi Sunak. You're going to have a lot of homeowners who are really, really furious by the time it comes to election. Nonetheless, Jeremy Hunt has ruled out any mortgage relief. The government not doing anything obviously has very, very serious consequences for people living in this country. And with that, it probably has very serious consequences politically for the government because one of Sunak's other pledges uh, was that he was going to halve uh, inflation. And this unlikely to be any improvement before the next election uh, in terms of the interest rates. And 400,000 householders are estimated to be coming to the end of their fixed term over the course of the next year. So this mortgage crunch is going to hit right in time for the election, which has to be called uh, at some point before February 2025. So it does sort of feel like it... It, 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 it could be a chicken that's going to come home to roost uh, quite unpleasantly for Sunak. Um, some solutions have uh, been coming in. Uh, John McDonald, the former shadow chancellor, has written an article that's published in The Guardian on Wednesday morning um, and suggested that the UK's five big banks would be required to pay a windfall tax of 15%. Now, the precedent he cites for this is the Building Society has actually made a customer payout uh, equivalent to about 15% of their profits. They've actually put that money back into customer accounts. Mm. So he isn't suggesting something without a very current, very relevant precedent. You know, if Nationwide are able to do this, then it seems unfathomable that the banks wouldn't be able to do this. Last month, they they said they announced they're going to pay £340 million directly into customer accounts for the first time after a jump in deposits and higher interest rates drove annual profits up 40%. And the payout is only worth 15% of those annual profits. So again, there is quite a specific precedent for this. Maybe they could take heed from John McDonnell, although I think that that is as likely as me being elected the next leader of the Conservative (laughs) Party. I think the Conservative Party taking what I would say is a very, very good idea from John McDonnell is as likely as me going, you know, I just think at the end of the day, people shouldn't pay tax. Well, you say that, but, you know, Boris Bikes was originally the previous mayor's idea. So, and he just put his name on it. So I'm just saying maybe uh, you could do the same. (laughs) Well, we'll put a call out. If John McDonnell is willing to forego the credit for this policy, (laughs) maybe we can trick Rishi Sunak into doing something good. 
Well, on the subject of uh, prime ministers that annoy us. Briefly, I just wanted to say that another Tory prime minister was back in the limelight as David Cameron and his Chancellor George Osborne made their appearances uh, at the COVID inquiry. And their uh, tone was very much, uh, we're fucking amazing, we're the best. (laughs) They they actually uh, argued that the austerity programme that they enacted uh, had actually helped the UK be better prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, But, I mean, that flies in the face of all evidence that flies in the face of all reasoned analysis of this. Uh, Anusha Kellyan has written a brilliant piece in the New Statesman this week uh, detailing how the freeze in public sector payment over two years after Osborne's emergency budget in 2010 has kick-started a decade that's had doctors and nurses essentially running on goodwill. NHS spending did rise, but at the slowest rate since the service was founded 75 years ago. And in November in 2019, just before the start of the pandemic, for the first time, every major A&E department in England missed its four-hour our waiting time target, okay? There were also massive cuts to social care, there were massive cuts to education spending, all of which impacted negatively. I know this is now becoming a weekly section, but (laughs) fuck David Cameron and fuck George Osborne. I, I find them to be two of the most reprehensible British political figures of my entire lifetime. Well, I mean, coming up next, we have Andy Burnham, Labour Mayor of Greater Manchester. We'll talk about the imbalance of power in the UK, Manchester City's impact on the city and the Hillsborough disaster in which 97 Liverpool football fans were unlawfully killed and how that defined his career. Joining us now is a man who could be described as one of the most powerful Labour politicians in the country, Andy Burnham is the mayor of Greater Manchester. He's a former MP and party leadership candidate and has been described as Labour's King of the North. Uh, Andy, how do you feel about the term King of the North? <laughs> Not even sure I'm king of my own uh, my own house, never mind uh, <laughs> the north of England. So uh, a bit of an overstatement, but uh, it, it kind of reflects though, that mayors in the north of England are giving the place more voice than it's had before. So that's that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that that you received sort of national attention uh, for the way that you fought for the resources needed to keep people in Greater Manchester safe during the COVID lockdowns. Um, We've actually got a clip, a very famous clip, of the moment during the negotiations when you were told by text of the offer from Boris Johnson's government whilst live on television. Right. So it's going to come into effect on Friday. Uh, At one minute past midnight on Friday... This is what's been said to MPs. It's going to be £20 million only, and they are going to try and pick off individual councils. I mean, it's, it's brutal, to be honest, isn't it? What, this isn't a way, this is no way to run the country in a national crisis. It isn't. This is not right. They should not be doing this, grinding people down, trying to accept the least that they can get away with. £22 million to fight the situation that we are in is, is frankly disgraceful. How was that, watching that back? Ah, uh, God, a bit, a bit hard because it just takes me right back to that, to that moment. You know, I was looking out at a pretty desolate city from where I was. Um, we've been really kind of through the mill with it all because we've been under restrictions for months and, you know, this kind of whole thing brought through just everything I can't stand about this country, to be honest, you know, the way the North gets treated. And it, here it was, yet another example. Couldn't have been more blatant, actually. Probably the most blatant example ever of people in the North of England being treated as second-class citizens. And, you know, it was um, live in front of all of those cameras. I mean, I was told, basically, that we were just going to get kind of railroaded into Tier 3, not enough money. Uh, and I, all of that was coming uh, in front of the, the bank of the world's media. So it was a pretty, uh, pr- pretty devastating moment. It was devastating for you, I know. But from here, it was really moving to see that a politician actually care, like genuinely to see it, not perform, not use a scripted line. I am not surprised that the jacket you wore is now in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I can't believe it. Any of the, my... my uh, Kind of wife and kids would are still amazed that any item of clothing that I own is anywhere near a, a museum. <laughs> but there we go. This life is strange, isn't it? But no, I kind of, I, I don't know. I mean, when I was in Westminster, people used to sort of laugh a bit, and I understand it. I look like a professional northern at times, and I, and I, I get that. But I've always been that because that's what brought me into politics in the first place. It was obviously a very, a very real reaction. But I kind of went into Westminster to advocate for the north, and strangely, I left it 
to advocate for the North. In the, I didn't feel I could do that job properly in Westminster. I had to sort of come out and start again. And yeah, in this role as mayor, I've kind of really felt that I can give voice to how people here feel. And it all came pouring out on that occasion. That's such an important point. This kind of journey that you've been on of going, you know, from the kind of north of England to Westminster and then back again and what you might have picked up on in that journey. And we definitely want to come back to that. I just want to briefly stay on COVID for a moment. There's two things I want to ask you about. The first thing is how you feel in light of what's happened with Boris Johnson. And I mean, I don't know if, do you take any satisfaction? I mean, satisfaction is probably not the right, right word, but is there any sense that to some extent he has met actual consequence? Oh, God, it, it isn't satisfaction. Um, it's just, I, get, I, I don't know, a, a sense of, well, at least there's been accountability is what I feel. Because when we were in negotiations with Downing Street, we could see that they just did not have a handle on things at all. They were living a very different pandemic to the one that we were living here in Greater Manchester. You know, we, we could see that and hear that in the things that they were saying to us. You know, we've been under restrictions since July here at that point. And here we were months into that situation and they were just all laughing, joking. And, and it, it, it just, it really brought home for me something that has been a bit of a theme of my life, that this country is two worlds. You know, people living very different lives from different social sort of backgrounds and circumstances. And I had such a profound sense of that at, at that particular moment in time, because we had no household mixing since July. You know, everyone was suffering, everyone was struggling. And it, it just felt that there was no understanding of that at all in 10 Down the Street. And I had a sense that they were doing things, you know, in a way that no one else was. And it, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not satisfaction, but it's just right that there is accountability for all of that. You know, we, I think we've all grown very tires, tired sorry, of people in Westminster who have no relationship to the communities, who probably never stepped foot in them, who don't know how people live and how they work and know anything about them making decisions about their lives. I know that uh, John McDonald was saying in The Guardian today that it's overdue that the mayors of our big cities are given the power to control rents. I know you've spoken about Germany being a great example. What do you think? Is, is Are more mayors what we need to fix Britain? I get more devolved power is what we need, Coco. It's not necessarily always mayors because you know mayors may not be right for some places. But what we need is more power at the local level, so people can can break down the the sort of silos that you get in Whitehall and make more kind of sensible decisions that are right for that area. You know, if you make change from the bottom up, it tends to be better change because you can involve people in you know the discussion about it. That is what we need, and actually, it's working. If you look around England. The places with a degree of devolution are making things happen. There's change uh, visible in the cities. Look at look at the skyline of Manchester city centre. This place is is really changing at this moment in time. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're kind of an outlier because most other countries have a form of 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 um, regional or local devolution. You know, we we don't. And that is one of the reasons why I would say we're a very unequal country. We've centralised power on one postcode in, in, in a part of London. Uh, nearly all decisions have been made out of there. And it's not surprising, is it, that that's giving us this huge north-south divide that uh, blights millions of lives. I mean, in terms of the north-south divide, you know, one of the signature policy pronouncements made by George Osborne was supposedly this idea of the northern powerhouse. Then Boris Johnson kind of uh, was elected essentially in part on a platform of levelling up. How do you see, if at all, the effects of the northern powerhouse, whatever the fuck that was supposed to be, <laughs> or, or levelling up whatever the yeah. fuck that was supposed to be? <laughs> I, yeah, it's... You know, everyone can have a degree of cynicism about it, but let me try not to be completely cynical. I, I have said on record that George Osborne was the first Chancellor to talk about the North in a, a very passionate way, uh, and I welcomed that. That was refreshing. Now, did all of the kind of rhetoric get matched with um, sort of the powers and the funding? Well, no, it didn't, but it did signal a change, and obviously we're, we're building on that change at the moment. And it's not, it's not synthetic. There is real change happening here. So, for instance, I'm the first mayor in England to put buses back under public control, and that will come in from September. And that will change things here more than, in some ways, any policy in Whitehall can change things here because every bus will change colour. You know, the, the kind of 
transport system on every street in Greater Manchester will look very, very uh, different. So actually, there is meaningful power that has been devolved. It can change things for the better. I would go so far as to say the combined authorities and mayors across England are the most functional part of of governance in the UK at this moment in time. As Wales as well. Uh, Wales are doing well as well. But I think <laughs> Wales plus us, we're the, we're the functional part of government in the UK. So does that mean you're never going to go back to Westminster? No time soon. I, and I mean it when I say it. I'm standing for a third term because I love this job. I don't know if it comes over, but I've been a bit liberated in the last uh, six years. I've been very energised by this. I came into politics, as I said, to kind of fight for the north and the northwest of England, was a place that I care about. And I, I kind of feel we're getting somewhere, but it's definitely not not job job done. And I, I think the problem with the question, I'm not sort of blaming you, Coco, and asking the question, but the problem with the question is it implies that Westminster is the only place really that matters at the end of the day and everyone would, in the end, want to be back there. I genuinely believe that myself, Steve Rotherham in Liverpool, Tracy Brabin in West Yorkshire, we're building something here that is about fixing politics in this country in the long term and to abandon it too early would be a real mistake. But one day, one day, I wouldn't rule out a return to Westminster. So you, you were an MP for 16 years. You've been mayor for six years. What, how would you compare those two experiences and what have you learned about the way the country is run and ways that we could improve it? Yeah, so I don't want to sound like I've always got a massive downer on Westminster because I, I loved a lot of my time there and it obviously was a, you know incredible experience. But I did hit a moment there where I kind of knew that uh, it really wasn't a place where I could be myself. Uh, so it was Hillsborough when as culture secretary, I was asked, well, I was, I was at, invited by um, uh, Steve, who was then Lord Mayor of Liverpool to go to Anfield on the 20th anniversary. But I, I knew I couldn't in some ways because I was in a government that hadn't done anything for them. And it kind of sparked something of a personal crisis, to be honest, in that I didn't know whether to accept. I didn't know whether to go. I just didn't know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to somebody who was at the other semi-final on the day of Hillsborough. So I knew it inside out from the start uh, and all of the lies and, and the injustice of it all. But why weren't you allowed to go? Well, the advice was not to go. You right. know, So the civil service advice was you shouldn't go. You know, this was dealt with back in the late 90s by the Stuart Smith inquiry, you, you, you shouldn't go. And that, that, for me, that uh, just was just really not an option. So in the end, I kind of took a personal decision in consultation with my family that I would go, but I wasn't going just for show. I was going to reopen Hillsborough and that clearly was not signed off by anybody in the government at all. But I was kind of consciously staking what political capital I had on, on that because I would have resigned from the cabinet had I not been able to do it. So that, that is the decision I'd made before I went. But the way I talk about it is that on that day, in many ways, when I stepped out to address the COP, I was stepping to, towards the very edge of the abyss between the government I was in and the people I grew up with. And I was you know, staring at them in the face. And I was kind of at, literally at that crossroads. And it kind of, I suppose, was the day that I took my first steps out of Westminster because I, I kind of began to realise that kind of Westminster doesn't let you be yourself. You have to mm. vote in certain ways. You have to say certain things. And it's not surprising, is it, at the end of all of that, that you don't come over to the public. They don't know who you are or what, what you're about. And kind of that experience said to me, well, I, I, in the end, I, I didn't come in it to be that kind of politician. I, you know, honestly, it may have looked like I was, you know, always in the suit and always <laughs> on message and always doing the sort of loyal thing. But in the end, that wasn't me. That wasn't why I came into it. And it was the experience of being culture sector on the 20th anniversary of Hillsborough that basically started my path out of Westminster. I think what you described there is I would echo completely, but as a voter, like as a voter, I've become very disillusioned with party politics because of the just clear towing the party line, not really knowing what anyone believes, not really knowing what anyone's values are and how they relate to me and what I believe in and, and, and ultimately safety and security for my own family. So I wanted to ask you a question that I asked uh, Emily Thornbury. I vote Labour, always have done. I vote Labour because I see it as a coalition. But increasingly, the voices are saying it is no longer a coalition, that there's only one type of centre-left person that is allowed to exist in the Labour Party. Do you agree with that? Is it still the coalition? Yeah, I, it is still a coalition. Um, but I've spoken out about a similar concern about Labour having too much internal factionalism between this, what people would call the right of the party and the left of the party. 
You know, if I go back to that period when I was kind of a younger uh, politician as Labour were coming into government in the 90s, I think there was a sense of all parts of the party having a voice and being kind of part of that part of that movement as Labour kind of went into into government. You know, John Prescott was in a position where he was speaking to a, a certain tradition and, and and other politicians as well. And I, and I do think that's I do think that's important. It's still there for for sure because um, some might say you know Angela Rayner is is sort of a fulfilling that, that role these days. And, you know, we, we've got a huge degree of support and loyalty to, to Angela here, but also to all of the, all of the, all of the shadow cabinet, to the leader of the party. You know, we want Labour to go into government, but I think it's a really important thing in this, from where we are now, is to build that sense of everybody involved, mm-hmm. everybody playing their part, you know, everybody with a contribution uh, to make, because some of the policies that Labour brought in in the early part of the time in government for instance, um, the national minimum wage, you know, that was championed by Ian McCartney and John Prescott and Dennis Skinner. So people who perhaps were not in the heart of New Labour, but still the policy agenda reflected the breadth of, of, of what uh, different voices were, were calling for. So, yeah, I, I think that's a really important uh, thing that you've put your finger on, Kogo. And I, and I do, you know, I do think, you know, it, there's a risk if factionalism goes too far and and uh, people kind of don't don't feel involved in in what's being done. What, what's your relationship like with Keir Starmer? Um, because there's been some talk that Labour HQ might have been briefing against you. I mean, do you are you on sort of good terms with the Labour leadership at the moment? Well, it is a. When I speak directly to Keir, absolutely. I, I think you know, I see those anonymous briefings in Westminster, but I think that's one of the unappealing. Uh, kind of parts of the Westminster culture, um, and you know, I, I don't think it helps to be honest. And it never did help uh, when I was in Westminster when when it happened. So, you know, I just go up with on the kind of relationships I I have with people and I've built over many years, and particularly the people in elected office. And I do draw a distinction. Um, so I have good relationship with Keir, members of the Shadow Cabinet, and colleagues from across the Labour Party, but. In, in saying that, I would also always want them to understand that I have a different job to do. I do have to speak for the place first, because if you don't, you're not being a good mayor. You're not really doing the job that you've been elected to do. What are your thoughts on uh, proportional representation? Arguably, Westminster, as it is, just cannot give the public what it needs in terms of reflecting its views, reflecting its opinions, reflecting its desires. I know you're now in a position where you can say things like that. So I just wondered, you know, what do you think? Should we uh, go back to the drawing board on how Westminster's run? Certainly we should. I'm uh, wholeheartedly in favour and I say that with the zeal of the convert. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest about that because obviously when you're in Westminster again, you kind of can't see it how other people see it sometimes. And I think it, it, it is a place like that, that it makes you absorb the traditions and, you know, and... Uh, people do get drawn in a bit to all of that. But when you're outside in a place like mine, and when I've been thinking deeply about the position of the North in this country, you cannot but conclude that there has to be radical parliamentary reform, a rewiring of this country. Every person and every place in this country won't count equally until every vote counts equally. It's as simple as that, Coco. And then if you combine it with the unelected lords, um, you know, we have a parliament that doesn't reflect uh, and represent all the regions and nations of the UK equally. It's it's a ridiculous state of affairs. So a complete rewiring is what's needed. And yes, proportional representation has to be at the heart of it. Is that what's drawing you back to Westminster? Because I have to say, listening to you talk so passionately, passionately about the job you're doing now and the place that you work in and your personal connection to it, I, I, one of the things I'm thinking in the back of my mind is, why the fuck would this bloke go back to Westminster? <laughs> yeah. like, he's, well, exactly. he's having a good time. I, I, I've been trying to say that in interviews <laughs> for ages. Like, I'm not going back anytime soon. But when I put the anytime soon bit on it, all of the Kremlin, isn't what they call Kremlinologists in Westminster <laughs> go, ah, oh, that means yeah, it. Yeah. So, but that's the thing. The Westminster sort of game is always like, what's the code here and what's, What's this mean and how can we deconstruct it and create a story out of it? I mean, the point is I, I left and I tried to do politics differently when I left. I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, if the government gets something right, I'll say so. If they get it wrong, I'll, I'll, I'll loudly say so. But I'm going to try and answer questions honestly. You know, I would, for the, all of my 16 years in, in Westminster, I would used to, get, used to get 
text from my wife in block capitals after doing media interviews, which kind of went along the lines of answer the F star, star, star in question. And so I used to say to her, I will, I'd like to, but I'm not really able to. So we used to have that joke about that all of the time. But when I left, I decided to answer the whatever question um, and try and just say to people, honestly, right, this is where I am. And always in the last six years, people have put the old Westminster, you know, de decoded the message and then written these stories. But I am really proud of what we're doing here. I am uh, passionate about the North and particularly Greater Manchester getting a, a stronger voice. I'm standing for a third term. I fully intend to uh, to, to complete it. Uh, and I think that's hard for people to understand sometimes, isn't it? But, but that is where I am in my life right now. Yeah, I think there's just an assumption that... Um you know, that every politician's ultimate ambition is to mm. end up in 10 Downing Street. Like, I think that they, like everybody sort of just assumes, well, if you... It's interesting. We all want our politicians to have the ultimate ambition of doing the best for the people that they serve. But also, we simultaneously harbour this idea that, well, they must just want to be prime minister. Like, I mean, do you, do you want to be prime minister? Well, if you'd have asked the 16-year-old me who was watching the Smiths on the Queen is Dead tour at Salford University, whether I'd, uh, what I'd feel about being mayor of Greater Manchester, I, I think I would have, I'd have fainted, I think it is what I would have, in fact, I think I did faint at that concert, I think. but anyway, that's a different story. Oh, Johnny um, Marr's a so, very good guitar player. I, 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 thought, I, I, well, I can understand that. that. Is it bittersweet that night, thinking about that after what's happened to Morrissey? I know, that, I mean, yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one because... For us in that era, Morrissey, he did change lives. There's no getting away from yeah. it. You know, he gave us a sense of aspiration that we didn't feel in other areas. And, you know, I got to university and, you know, all of these other people from other parts of England loved the Smiths. And I said, well, I've seen them. And it was like, we had finally from the North something that they wanted. And it was, <laughs> it was like a really empowering thing, to be honest. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the Smiths were massive in, in, my, in my early years. And, yeah, I do, you know, I feel... This, you know, that's sad in some ways about, about the way things are. In terms of just, to my point I was trying to make though is, Mayor of Greater Manchester is beyond my wildest dreams and, and I'm doing a job that I really love doing. And so if this is where it ends, that I'd be, thank, thank you very much. And <laughs> I feel honored, honored to have done it all. And I, who knows though? I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to give you a sort of a, a, a kind of corny answer. If there, were, if there, was, a, if there was a path back to Westminster beyond me doing this role, then I, I obviously I've not ruled that out at all and, and would consider that. I'd probably be a better, a much better politician down there than I was if I were to take it. Um, let's talk about football, but let's try and sail past Everton hmm. uh, for your yeah. benefit. As much yeah. as anyone else Thank you. Has You're very kind, actually. Thanks very much. <laughs> I don't think that, that can't have been a fun season. Um, I want to talk about uh, Man City um, and the impact that the Abu Dhabi ownership is having on the wider city. Um, there has been, uh, there have been a series of articles written, a really great piece written in The Guardian by Aditya Chakraborty about the city council selling swathes of land to the club's owners and what that effect, what effect that might be having on the city. Is it something that concerns you? Well, all what I would say to people, you know, who, who say that and make commentary about it, go to East Manchester now and look at photographs of it 30 years ago. I mean, this is, people use the word transformation, don't they, these days? Well, this actually lives up to that, to that word. And a large amount of the investment has uh, come in uh, from from the owners of Manchester City, so they are more than building a football club. They are they are building a part of a city. They are investing. We've got uh, the biggest indoor arena in the UK opening later. Well, no, next year now actually. Uh, Co-op Live, which will be an amazing uh, addition to the to the campus. They haven't just invested in commercial facilities. They've invested in colleges, housing. Um, you just have to judge them on on the record of investment in in Manchester and. Obviously, they built a team that's brought City the treble. And I would say, you know, I think I'm right in saying that we are now one of only two cities in Europe where two teams have won uh, the Champions League. This is the football capital of Europe. Um, and the players they brought in, my God, you know, can I just say, Jack Grealish, thank you, single-handedly <laughs> restored our reputation as the home of 24-hour party people. <laughs> Boris Johnson and 10 Downing Street made a kind of a, a pitch for our crown, didn't they, with all of the uh, the stuff that was going on down there in the pandemic. But uh, 
uh, Jack has uh, has put them right back in their place. Though, I mean, I do want to stick with Man City, especially when we consider the. Uh, the reputation of Abu Dhabi, you know, torture, detention, criminalisation of gay people. You can understand why people are concerned about this, right? Yeah, I, I, I hear what, what, what people say. I've got to judge um, what, what, what I see in, on what I see in, in Manchester and, and how I see uh, the owners run Manchester City and, and what they do to, to improve uh, life here. So, you know, those issues obviously are for the government to raise a, a, a different level. Um, we've had a long-standing kind of way of working in this country, haven't we, where we've, we've welcomed in investment from other parts of the world into our utilities, into other walks of life, and we can all debate the rights and the rights and wrongs of that. But if I'm just seeing where I am, judging as I find, they've, they've been huge partners uh, for, for the city and they've improved a lot of lives here. Uh, and I, I need to be honest about that and, and give credit where it's due. As someone who is from London, please just may I warn you that foreign investors are not great. (laughs) The housing (laughs) in London is horrible. Many communities displaced can't live where they were. Is that is that something that you can assure the citizens of Manchester won't happen to them? Well, no, I I hear what you're saying. And obviously, you know, we we do look at what happened. And, you know, Manchester is in a good moment at the moment. But I understand that things can turn quickly and housing is a, a real challenge in the city for, for certain. Some of the homes actually that um, uh, that uh, City Group have, have helped build have been affordable homes in place, parts, places like Ancoats. So I hear what you're saying and we're very conscious of that Manchester City Council are having a huge drive now on building homes for social rent. Uh, we have a lot of work going on on homelessness as, as you probably know. So no, we, we hear that. You know, we are uh, taking steps to ensure that the the kind of city is truly for everybody, that this is a place where where, where everybody uh, can live. Uh, and that's the approach we're taking as we go forward from here. Andy, I know you are a music lover. We are as well. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to say, I've been looking into nightlife in the UK. London has gone the way of the dodo, but Manchester's still thriving. Uh, so c- thank you for that. Congratulations on no keeping worries. bars open. Although there is one that is the Night and Day Cafe, which is having yeah. a little bit of an issue. I just wanted to ask you, can you get that sorted, please, Andy? For, <laughs> for our <laughs> listeners, Night and Day Cafe is an, uh, an iconic venue in Manchester. It was home to a number of really important bands, you know, Elbow. Um, and right now they have been served with a noise abatement order from a new resident who moved to the area during COVID, said it was too loud, even though that uh, venue arguably helped regenerate that area to make it desirable for such luxury flats that the person moved into. But there we go. If they have to keep the noise down, it may force their closure Andy, sort it out, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing my best. I was there last week. I, I love it as well. It's a fantastic venue. Uh, and we've got loads of brilliant venues a- across the city. I, I, I will do anything within my power to, um, to ensure that night and day uh, doesn't just survive, but thrives. You know? So you know, we're all behind it. Obviously, there's a legal process that we can't sort of just uh, wish away. But... Uh, we are going to support them, whatever the outcome of that of that is. I, it feels like how I related to London 10, 12 years yeah. ago, yeah. whereas now yeah. a lot of those fun venues in London are shutting because, you know, people have bought luxury flats and they don't want to live in the areas that have items that made them desirable in the first place. Like, is how could how, what's a practical... Is there a way that we can fight that kind of the throttling of our nightlife by the gentrifiers. Maybe we could do it a bit like flatmate interviews where as a community, <laughs> you get to interview the people buying the luxury flat. Have you heard yeah. of New Order? Do you know what the Hacienda <laughs> is? You You'd cannot- be off the list straight away if you... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, a test. We could have a little mank, mank yeah. music test <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be as good. part of the housing applica- housing <laughs> institute. But um, no, I, I don't think they're all luxury flats, though. That's one thing to say here. I mean, we have there's quite a mix, and the city council have, have made sure of that. What I do find is, and I know you as sort of two Londoners, you may not like me saying this, but there are a lot of twenty somethings and thirty somethings from London living here now because they've realised they can have a different life here than they could in London. So they live in the city. They live in Ancoats or they live in the Northern Quarter uh, and they have not a luxury flat, but an affordable flat uh, and a graduate job. And I think that's one of the reasons why Manchester is going to have a good decade uh, ahead of us. Uh, Because, you know, we've got a lot, we're a young city. We are young and getting younger. We're fast growing. 
we have a load of music happening because of that. Uh, a massive new arena being built, as I said, but loads going on in our in our smaller venues. And to show we're not all money, and every, I've taken the decision to put buses under public control, so we're going to have a transport system soon that looks a bit like London. So we're taking the best of London, definitely, <laughs> and bringing it here. And and as you know, it's a myth that that we all hate London. We don't. We love London, <laughs> but we just want a bit more of what London's got up here without the bad bits. Before we go, Andy, I want to ask you the most probably the most difficult question we could possibly have asked you at this point. A hypothetical question. If you could only have one, would it be Everton winning the Champions League? Or... Stop, there. Stop there, it's one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, this is going to make headlines because the alternative was going to be Labour winning the next election. Ah, right, well, I, my heart still says one, so I don't know. I, 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 I'm desperately keen for Labour to win the next election. And uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, but I love Everton. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... I think we can leave it there. Thanks, Andy. I think you've, you've sort of summed it all up. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, great talking to you both. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, great. Andy. Thanks, Thank Andy. you so much. Cheers. 75 years ago, on the 22nd of June, 1948, the HMT Empire Windrush first docked in England at Tilbury Docks in Essex. On board were men and women from the Caribbean who answered Britain's call to help fill post-war labour shortages. Those 800 people and their children and grandchildren helped get the country back on its feet and helped transform Britain into the vibrant multicultural society it is today. The Windrush generation is a poetic term for people who arrived in the UK from Caribbean countries between 1948 and 1971, when British immigration laws changed. Despite answering the call to help rebuild the UK, they faced horrific discrimination, including from our banks. Unable to open accounts, they relied on a traditional community saving system called a partner hand, handing over their cash to a trusted member of the community who would then give the total sum to a different saver each week. Catherine Ross is the founder and director of Museum and the National Caribbean Heritage Museum. It's just opened a new exhibition at the Bank of England Museum about partner hands. And when I spoke to her earlier, she told me how important they were to people rejected by the banks. One thing about Caribbeans, we are creative and we're resilient. So when they said that, eureka moments went on up and down Britain and people decided to use that age-old tradition and create the partner hand. And so it was a community of form of savings that people then use, not just to save money and send back home, but to create for themselves communities and infrastructures so that they could thrive. So people use it to build churches. People use it to create community centres. People used it to create um, educational facilities because in schools at that time, um, educationists were saying that black children were educationally subnormal. We knew that was rubbish, so we created after-school weekend clubs for children to learn. But then we were told we're tiring out the children by making them work on a Saturday. Uh, but now everybody goes to private tuition and after-school clubs. So again, that's a, a thing that we have introduced into Britain. Um, can I just ask a little bit about your backstory? You came from St Kitts when you were seven. I have to say, Catherine, I'm looking at you on screen. That Those numbers defy me. <laughs> oh, you're my new best friend. <laughs> thank you, thank you. There's so many moments in the 75 years of the Windrush generation, which you're part of, um, mm -hmm. to be proud of. I know you, it's hard to pick one, but could you for me? The music. We've contributed 52 genres of music to Britain. So, and that was great. Now, when I said this to somebody, they said to me, oh, but we played black music from America. Exactly that. These 52 genres were our music that was affected by the black Caribbean experience. So I'm proud of that. We impacted on that. I'm pleased also the fact that we introduce, in, we introduce uh, moisturising to Britain. <laughs> Black skins are sensitive and delicate and they need to be regularly moisturised. <laughs> when we came and went to school, English kids or the parents used to spit on a hanky and wipe their face. That was their cleansing <laughs> and cleaning. Uh, we were not into that. We didn't find that very um, a, a good practice. But what we did use, what we had to use to keep our skins um, beautiful were things like cocoa butter 
aloe vera and so on. But when you put that on as a child and your white friends saw you, they invariably said, what's that foreign muck you're putting on yourself? Now that foreign muck is bottled in beautiful containers and uh, everybody use it as we now say through the museum, even men moisturise yeah. nowadays. <laughs> so uh, we, we've made a great stride there. Absolutely. I mean, look, you know, I don't want to end on a serious note, but as much as the Windrush generation and the community has done so much for Britain, it hasn't always been treated fairly and it hasn't always been reciprocated. What would you like to see happen for, for the Caribbean community in the UK? I'd like the people to acknowledge what we've done, to recognise us for what we've done. So, you know, all documents, policies and whatever will say this idea came from or we've adopted a practice that came from the Caribbean. I'd like that acknowledge we we were here for centuries and we've made a difference to all aspects of life. Um, and that is not in the history books. That is not necessary in novels or anything like that. I'd like that in there. So that's one thing. But I want our people to take responsibility as well. In most Caribbean houses, um, Windrush arrivals, they had on the top of their wardrobe the suitcase that they came with. And in that were important papers, just in case you had to run back to, or chase back um, to your country of origin. So I want all black people to have in that suitcase on the top of their wardrobe or somewhere similar, um, Evidence of the contribution that that person, that individual has made um, to life in Britain. So early records of, of um, achievements, um, cups, medals and things that they've made. I'd like to see people keep and store and show that they have indeed made a contribution to the UK. That was Catherine Ross, founder and director of Museum and the National Caribbean Heritage Museum. Their exhibition, Pardner Hand, a Caribbean answer to British banking exclusion is free and runs at the Bank of England Museum until June next year. You can hear more from Catherine on their new podcast, Objects and Tings, which celebrates 75 years of Caribbean people in the UK through the objects they cherish the most. While lots of events are taking place to celebrate the 75th anniversary, uh, including the release of a new 50 pence coin, we shouldn't ignore the fact that the name Windrush is also synonymous with one of the biggest scandals of the last decade. In 2018, uh, it emerged that thousands of British citizens, mostly from the Caribbean, were wrongly detained, deported or threatened with deportation, despite having the right to live in the UK. An independent review uncovered a profound institutional failure that had destroyed hundreds of people's lives. Many were deported to countries that they'd not lived in since they were children. And 24 of those people died before the government could contact them to apologise for its error. Now, the Windrush is, as a scandal, something that I think is a profound stain mm. on our national character and our national government. And when something like that happens, what you want is an apology, but also you immediately want the machinery to start whirring to ensure that something like it could never happen mm -hmm. again. Unfortunately, uh, that does not seem to be the case. Um, Amelia Gentleman, who was the Guardian journalist who uh, originally reported on the scandal, uh, has been speaking this week about the fact that the transformation directorate which is the unit tasked with handling the changes and it's meant to actually help stop something like this from ever happening again has been shut down uh, wow. by the current home secretary suella braverman on top of that there were 30 recommendations made by the windrush review and only eight of those have been met 13 of them have been partially met and nine had not been met or were dropped. And there's a BBC investigation uh, that's been published on Wednesday morning that hundreds of long-term sick and mentally ill people from the Windrush generation were sent back to the Caribbean. So there's a, there are even further layers to this scandal that are still being uncovered. And the scandal within a scandal mm. is that the Home Office is now quietly trying to roll back some of the recommendations and ignore others and also has shut down the unit that was designed to stop this from ever happening again. It, it's absolutely unfathomable to me. And I mean, yeah, we, uh, as part of that, what's happening with the Windrush compensation scheme? Yeah. That's been previously described by Human Rights Watch as just not being fit for purpose. 
The reason it's not fit for purpose is, is because it places too much of a burden on claimants around documentation and just this level of detail, this kind of bureaucratic detail, which is not possible for the average person to kind of navigate through without the support of a lawyer. So immediately people that don't have money from that are locked out of that justice. Even the people whose applications have been successful, they've been very slow to to pay it out. Jacqueline McKenzie, partner at the law firm Lee Day, says it takes about 12 months to get an initial decision. Then those initial decisions are often wrong. Uh, She cites the case of a man who was initially told he was entitled to zero zero compensation. But when it was reviewed, he was told he was actually entitled to £289,000. Just as an aside, like that, that approach, in my view, is hostile environment. Yeah. The fact that they are making it so hard for you to get justice, so hard to get compensation, is an extension through paperwork this time of the hostile environment. Yeah, and I think we should be clear, because obviously we do have listeners that uh, aren't from the UK who might not be aware of some of the background and the detail to this. Let's be absolutely clear here. The Windrush scandal was not an accident of poor administration. It was the direct result of a policy announced by the government in 2012 that was labelled the hostile environment, that was designed to make a hostile environment for immigrants and undocumented undocumented migrants and ultimately push them to leave. The policy tasked the NHS, landlords, banks, employers and many others with enforcing immigration controls. The then Home Secretary, Theresa May, was in charge at a point where there were vans being driven around Mm. areas densely populated with immigrant communities, encouraging them to go home. Mm. This is not this is not just to do with you know people's IDs being mislaid. This is to do with systemic institutional racism. A lot of the people from the Windrush generation arrived as children on their parents' passports. Then on top of that, the Home Office destroyed thousands of the landing cards and records that would have given them documentation to prove their right to remain in the UK. This is plain and simple the result of systemic racism and the result of how systemic racism manifests itself in political policy. This is the fault of Mm. the Conservative government at the time. And as a consequence of that, I think the absolute least the current Conservative government could do is absolutely to accept the recommendations of the findings keep the organisation within the Home Office that's designed to stop something like this from ever happening again and roll back on some of their rhetoric. Because if anything, it's escalated even further under Priti Patel and then Suella Braverman. And just on a personal level, this is specifically anti-black racism and it is profoundly disquieting to me as a British South Asian person, it it makes me very upset to see South Asian faces being the face of this anti-black racism. I I feel embarrassed by it. Mm. I really, I really, really do. This is outrageous. This is a stain. This is an injustice. And, you know, the fact of the matter is it has... It is anti-black, but nonetheless, it has ramifications for all people who were not born in the UK or or even just people of colour. Like, we, sh- we should care about this. This is important. They might be trying to let it go, but we certainly won't be. So it's time to hand out our prestigious Pod Save the UK Hero and Villain of the Week awards. Nish, I think you're going for a gathering of villains this week. It's the event uh, that was organised uh, around the campaign for uh, unsuccessful London mayoral applicant Sean Bailey. Um, yeah, this is the uh, video that's emerged this week uh, that was obtained by the Mirror newspaper of the uh, uh, party that, shall we say... Uh, bent lockdown conve- <laughs> lockdown rulings. Um, it obviously, it's an absolute disgrace. Uh, even a Conservative MP, Tobias Elwood, has said that Sean Bailey should actually turn down the peerage that Boris Johnson uh, awarded him. Uh, Mr Bailey has told ITV News he was upset to watch the footage uh, and said that he had left before uh, the timing of the video and said that it had obviously turned into something uh, once I'd left. Uh, And what it had turned into uh, was, based on the invites that the BBC has obtained, was a jingle and mingle Christmas drinks. Yeah, so this was a photograph that we actually had already all seen. It was on the front page of a lot of newspapers, but now the uh, video has emerged. And in the video, we can hear people at the party talking about how this was a violation of the regulations. 
It's a fucking disgrace. It's a fucking disgrace on any number of levels, not least because it looks like the worst party in human history. It is absolutely <laughs> embarrassing. It, I mean, more than anything else, everyone who's at that party should hang their head in deep shame. This is whatever the anti Grealish is, it's this. It's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. an absolutely awful party. But also, you know... It, it, this stuff does matter. There are people who couldn't see their loved ones dying. And what we have here is a bunch of people who are working pretty close to the heart of government who weren't following the lockdown regulations. It is truly a fucking embarrassment. And I hope that if ever you find yourself invited to a party with one of the people in this video, <laughs> you make it your business to make sure that they feel deeply unwelcome and leave immediately. <laughs> if for no other reason, then the vibe is going to be shit because they clearly don't know how to have a good time. Coco, save us all. Inject some positivity into proceedings. Yes. I've talked about this. these lockdown people, David Cameron, the racist government, Rishi Sunak. I've brought a lot of negativity to this show. <laughs> we even asked Andy Burnham about Morrissey. We've brought, there's been a lot of vibe killing. Get us on a positive note. Give us our hero of the week. Listen, Nish, you need to lie down. <laughs> That you need after all of that. But I do have some uh, some good news. The Pod Save the UK Hero of the Week is da -da -da -da, Graham Souness, former Liverpool and Scotland footballer, self-styled hard man who has just swam the channel to raise £1 million for charity. I'm obsessed with this story. I genuinely... Oh, you know, I was talking about anxiety earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, in that moment of anxiety, I read this story and I genuinely welled up. Maybe it was chemical, I don't know, but I think it was it's quite a beautiful story. He he was inspired to swim the channel after meeting a 14-year-old called Isla Grist. She suffers from a really rare and painful skin blistering condition called, and I hope I say this right, epidermolysis bullosa. Uh, she's had that condition since birth and it means that she has to be wrapped head to toe in bandages. They need to be changed three times a week in a procedure that is extremely painful. Uh, Sooner said he became aware of the disease about five years ago and it just floored him. Just her strength, her courage, her ability to be optimistic despite all of that. And yeah, he decided to, to raise some money for her. So here's Graham telling BBC Breakfast why he did it. You know, this disease is... It's a cruelest... Um, excuse me. I knew this would happen. It's the cruelest, nastiest disease out there that I know of. And, you know, for someone so young to be so brave and, you know, and I was aware of the impact this has on her mum and dad. And she, she, she helps them. This is a very special young lady you're in the company of. I felt emotional again. I could feel yeah. myself going, <laughs> Um, I hope the uh, listeners feel the same as me. Um, Sunes completed the 21-mile swim as part of a six-person relay team. Um, that also featured Isla's father, Andy. They did it in 12 hours and 17 minutes. What I like about this story is, you know, the kindness of strangers, the ability for people from completely different walks of life to support each other, the compassion. I love it when a hard man cries anyway. Um, but also, just as an aside, Graham Sunis is 70 years old. <laughs> he is an inspiration to all of us. Um, and you can find out more by visiting the website of the charity. It's www. Debra, D E B R A dot org dot UK. They do amazing work supporting people with, um, again, I'll try to say this correctly, epidermolysis bullosa. It's also known as butterfly skin. Just time for a quick dip into our inbox uh, where there's a lot of positive reaction to our guest last week, uh, Labour's Dr. Rasen Alan Khan. Marcus D. Walters called her a marvel of humanity, uh, while uh, another um, person who <laughs> has contacted us uh, under the name at Chicken Nug Nugs, which is not the name that I wanted to be reading out in conjunction with this story, uh, at Chicken Nug Nugs said she's a credit to our country in Parliament, hoping she gets far more prominence in the future. What a woman. What an erudite thing to be written by someone called at Chicken Nug Nugs. I love Chicken Nug Nugs. That, that that suggests that someone to me tweeted us from their alt account and didn't realise that they hadn't realize. changed it. I'll uh, do this from my uh, academic account. I hope I don't get this mixed up with my chicken enthusiast's Twitter account, at Chicken Nug Nugs. Uh, if you did uh, miss that interview with Dr. Rasen Alan Khan, uh, I'd recommend you give it a listen. Uh, you can find it. Uh, it's episode seven on our feed. But be warned, one of our listeners, at Dr. Zayas, said... The emotional whiplash from this episode broke me. And PSUK could do that to you. Also, 
I hope that that is Dr. Zayas, the real, as <laughs> yeah. in the, the monkey doctor from Planet of the Apes. I just, I just can't stop thinking about Chicken Nug Nugs. At Chicken Nug Nugs, <laughs> if you do want to get in touch with us again, <laughs> please <laughs> let us know your real name. Or if you wish to remain anonymous, just give us a shout and say, uh, I'm quite happy for you to continually refer to me to Chicken Nug Nugs. <laughs> I want to send Chicken Nug Nugs some nuggets. I want to <laughs> please let us know where you are so we can send them. Um, sadly, that is it from us this week. If you want to be like at Chicken Nug Nugs and get in touch with us, uh, email us at psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk or you can send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Our number is 07514644572. Internationally, that's plus four four seven five one four six four four five seven two. If you're new to the show, remember to hit follow on your app and you get a new episode every week. Pod Save the UK is a reduced listening production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop. Video editing was by David Kaplowitz and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer David Dugahi. The executive producers are Louise Cotton, Dan Jackson, Madeline Herringer and Michael Martinez. Watch us on the Pod Save the World YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and TikTok where we're at Pod Save the UK or on Instagram through the Crooked Media channel. And hit subscribe for new shows every Thursday on Spotify, Amazon or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Chicken Nug Nug forever! <laughs> oh, he's made my day! Oh.